So most of you already know I'm taking a course on A.N. Whitehead's metaphysics and uh, cosmology right now. And um, I think I've narrowed down exactly what I'm going to focus on in, a, in my paper. Um, and that is the relationship between inorganic matter and um, life, between molecules and um, autopoiesis, or the self-production, self-organization that we find in um, its minimal form as a, a free-living cell. Um, I want to try to understand better what it is that needs to be accounted for in this transition from matter to life. Um, because the classical uh, materialist assumption would be that life can be accounted for only in terms of efficient causation, uh, in, in terms of the exchange of energy between, between bodies of some kind. Um, and it would indeed appear that modern biology is, is pretty well established that there's nothing going on inside the body that contradicts uh, physical principles. Um, you know, uh, gravity, electricity, the strong and weak nuclear forces aren't contradicted in living organisms. The laws of thermodynamics aren't contradicted in living organisms. Um, you know, people used to think that life and evolution were in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics, but we know now that because life is an open system, uh, or organisms represent open systems, and the Earth as a whole is an open system, receiving all the energy that it does from the sun, uh, and having to dissipate it somehow back into space. Um, you know that situation provides the uh, the tremendous gradient necessary for life to be feasible in a physical world. Um, so we could say that living organisms are dependent upon physical matter. Um, but the question is, can we account entirely for organisms in terms of what they are dependent on in order to emerge, this physical stuff? Can we account for life only in terms of cause and effect? Um, and I wouldn't think that were possible because you know at some point if we're going to understand life we have to understand consciousness because we human beings the scientists the ones the ones doing this um, apparent explanation of uh, of life are also living organisms uh, and so we're also trying to account for ourselves when we account for life and if we say that life can be accounted for entirely in terms of efficient causation, in terms of a mechanism of some kind, uh, then we're negating ourselves and saying we actually aren't conscious in the sense that consciousness implies having some sort of free will, some sort of ability to respond to what you are aware of um, in a way that's not just you as another uh, notch on a gear being uh, turned along. So I would say if you if you're going to understand how a cell is different from molecules, you have to account for how um, the molecules by becoming determined by the structure of this larger entity that they emerge as, also become free as that larger structure or freer than they were prior. Um, freer in the sense that they now feel more than they could alone. Uh, but in order to feel more than they, than they could alone, uh, they had to give up their, a large degree of their autonomy. Um, molecules, macromolecules, proteins, um, had to become imprisoned in a cell. Um, many, or much pun intended, um, 
but by doing so they gained the freedom of uh, that which was created by their common um, organization. So, uh, you know, I've just implied that molecules already had some feelings and that they intensified them by merging into a cell. And, um, you know, I do that because if we're going to account for uh, the final causation, it's, it's obvious in, in higher organisms, any animal, I think, but definitely in human beings, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to push it, um, it's, it's actually, you know, in any life, I recognize final causation. A bacterium swimming up a, a sucrose gradient is an example of goal-directed behavior. Um, so I don't think you can account for life with only efficient causes. Uh, if, if you're going to talk about life at all and admit it as a phenomenon distinct from uh, purely material or mechanical uh, systems, material systems, inorganic systems, then the only reason we distinguish it is because it displays some sort of goal-oriented behavior. Um, and I think that's the reason that you see final causation is because there is sentience there, um, which, you know, sentience isn't something you can uh, see in the sense that it is, is available to your senses, you know, you can't feel the weight of it, um, you can't measure the size of it, um, you can't clock how fast it is because it's invisible. Um, it's it represents the possibility of the future, the possibility of that um, organism deciding its future. Um, so you know, while it's it's this quality of of freedom is pretty much negligible in matter, um, we do find a small degree of it there because even in physics they recognize that. Um, the way that the structure of an atom is a product of our particular cosmic history. Um, and, you know, the, the quantum fluctuations during the first, uh, you know, few moments of the Big Bang that allowed a gradient to arise uh, and the structure of, of our current universe to emerge. Um, all of this happened by chance. And by chance, what we call the laws of nature were formed. They all have a history, in other words. They evolve just like life evolves. So matter has made choices. It's, it's made irreversible decisions that affect the future, uh, which is now, for us, um, in a very significant way. Uh, so, you know, we aren't entirely free because we're alive. We're still in part determined by our past, but we're also given the potential to be alive by our past because of the past decisions that have been made that made the options we have today possible. So we're given the present by the past, but it's our responsibility now uh, to create something new to hand to the next uh, present as a present. So, to understand this, the way we can bridge this gap between matter and life is really to recognize that matter had been alive from the beginning. I mean, that's um, a very simplified way of exactly what we have to do here, or what I'm going to try to do in my paper. Uh, is to explain why this is necessary and what it actually means. Um, because when you say it quite simply that matter is alive, uh, it strikes many people as um, an affront to common sense or an anthropomorphism, uh, um, you know, a projection of some kind. So I have to uh, explain in my paper why it is not that and why it is necessary for science to remain um, useful in the face of our exploring uh, phenomena like life.